why don't we get uh, started? Um, thank you all for coming. Um, so my name is Chris Yokel. I'm a member of the English department here. And I've also been involved in, in one book for the, basically since I started here, um, uh, the past few years. Um, so this is uh, this is kind of our key event for the spring in terms of uh, in terms of the one book. So this year's one book is The Hate You Give uh, by Angie Thomas. It's a young adult novel um, about this young girl uh, named Star Carter, um, who basically is an eyewitness to her 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 kind of best friend from childhood, or her male friend, uh, getting shot by a police officer. And, and the book really grapples with um, the kind of the fallout of that. Um, but then also just really the, the black experience in America. So um, Star and her family live in a what we might call a typical poor black neighborhood. Um, but she goes to a sort of white, rich prep school. Um, so a lot of the story is about her kind of living this dual existence um, uh, in, in her sort of black home world, white school world. Um, she talks about being, you know, white star and then so she's kind of um, too black for her white friends, but then at home she's sort of too white for her black friends because she goes to white prep school. So it's a lot about identity. Um, but uh, today particularly, we're gonna be getting into some of just the background uh, that informs the book. Um, so, uh, and Robin will, there's a, there's a scene from the film version that Robin will show where uh, Star and her dad, Maverick, have a conversation um, about what he calls the trap. So you know, she, she, um, she finds out in the midst of the story that her friend Khalil was, had become involved in selling drugs for like the kind of drug lord of the neighborhood. Um, <coughs> and you know, she starts to kind of question everything she knows and, and she, she wonders like why, you know, why would he do something like this? And so her and her dad have this conversation where it's like, well, well what else was available to you, right? Um, <laughs> Walmart's certainly not coming to our neighborhood, like there's no opportunities for us, so that's what often drives young men into doing things like selling drugs. Um, and the reality is, is there's a lot of actual history and government policy behind that. And so, um, so Robin is here today to talk about that, to talk about economic how, and housing segregation, redlining, historic policies in the US that actually have led to things like this, led to ghettoization and, and led to kind of um, uh, limited opportunities for African Americans. So, so it's it's um, just providing, shedding some historical light on on contemporary realities um, surrounding things that are obviously very, you know, kind of hot button issues even in our country right now. Right, as we talk about racial issues and stuff. Um, so, Robin is uh, she's an associate professor of history uh, here at the school um, and also the the civic learning fellow for the last center. Um, so, it seems perfectly appropriate that she would be the one talking about this topic. So I will turn it over to Robin. So thanks for coming, everyone. And thank you, Chris, for inviting me. And um, uh, I don't know, how, how many of you have read the book, I Hate You Give? Uh, a couple of you, OK. Um, so I've, I used uh, the Hate You Give last semester in, in my History 114, which is the survey course that covers uh, the second half of U.S. history from 1877 on. Uh, so I've read it, and um, it was really, uh, I was saying to Chris earlier that I, I had a fair amount of information about uh, the segregation of, of African Americans, but in researching for this presentation uh, today, I, I was stunned um, uh, all over again uh, at the, the sort of purposeful planning of both federal and state and local governments in segregating African-American uh, people to particular communities. And uh, as Chris said, I want to start with a clip uh, from the book, uh, excuse me, from the movie that was made from the book about, um, it explains the title of the book and it also uh, gives you uh, just a little snippet of, of what they call the trap, or Marv calls the trap. You know, it's it sense out of It's bad life. 
the hate you give little infants. That's yes, everybody. I know what it stands for. What do you think it means? I think it's about us. That's who? Black people. Poor people, everybody at the bottom. Are you on it? Pop was trying to school us and how the system's designed against us. Why don't you think so many people in our neighborhood do? They need the money. Yeah. And they don't real jobs around here. So they fall into the trap. So we're gonna think about what this this trap is and, and how um, how black families, how black Americans are caught into this trap. And uh, in thinking about this presentation today, um, I, I was thinking that Americans, I think, at least white Americans as a whole, tend to think of segregation as perhaps uh, something that just happens, right? That there's a tendency for uh, uh, white Americans to want to distance themselves from black Americans because of racism and that perhaps black Americans want to live together in their own segregated communities, right? Something we call de facto segregation. Um, but today, I want to argue that actually uh, this was purposefully done and that uh, segregated communities were actually created or even engineered by these different entities, by, by individuals, by, by different government entities um, and so we really can't think of it as de facto segregation, but de jure de facto, which means by law. Um, and uh, not only did these uh, agencies segregate people into separate communities, they did it by desegregating communities that already, uh, integrated communities that already existed. Um, and in the process of doing this, uh, they actually had to find end runs around uh, laws and judicial decisions uh, and uh, uh, even, even uh, the constitutional uh, protections that African Americans <coughs> had uh, in the, specifically in the 13th and 14th amendments. Um, and then I also want to spend a few minutes thinking about sort of the legacy of this residential segregation and how it uh, affects many, many um, parts of society today. So I want to start by thinking about public housing. And uh, I suspect if I asked all of you uh, what public housing is, you would likely say that public housing is for extremely poor people or indigent people. But actually, the history of public housing is very different. Public housing started uh, as a way to, um, uh, um, uh, to uh, eliminate a housing crisis that happened beginning in the middle of the 1920s. There was a housing bubble that burst, uh, and then, of course, um, uh, the Great Depression uh, made this even worse, uh, starting in 1929. But uh, the first public housing was actually designed for working and lower class middle, uh, uh, working and lower middle class Americans, and not necessarily for the poorest of the poor. So, um, starting in uh, 1933, uh, after the Great Depression has hit and and Roosevelt comes into office, and I'm sure you've all heard of the New Deal, uh, the Public Works Administration is created and. Uh, this, is, this is part of the New Deal, and it's created as a way not only to put people back to work building houses, but also to alleviate this, this housing crisis that, that, uh, that is occurring in the country. Um, uh, the Great Depression, uh, see, and during the Great Depression, there's 25% uh, unemployment. Uh, that's an average uh, figure. Uh, that figure is 50% amongst African Americans in the country. Uh, and uh, people, uh, because they can't work, they end up losing their homes. Uh, people, a lot of people are homeless. They end up making little tent cities, which they call Hoover Towns, but that's another story. Uh, and so this, this Public Works Administration is created as a way to, to build housing for people and put people back to work. Um, originally, this uh, plan for public housing really didn't include black Americans. 
But Harold Ixis, who's the Secretary of the Interior, uh, and, and a noted progressive, by the way, uh, Ixis was um, at one time a, a chapter head for the NAACP, his local NAACP chapter. Um, he argues for uh, public housing to include African Americans. Ixis also comes up with this formula, this neighborhood composition rule. So he proposes that in, in neighborhoods that are all white, public housing should be for white Americans. That in neighborhoods uh, that are mostly black, they should be for black <coughs> Americans. But he also argued that in integrated neighborhoods, they should remain integrated. But the Public Works Administration, in conjunction, by the way, because they worked with with uh, uh, local and uh, state uh, agencies uh, did not follow ICSIS's uh, rule. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. So in Atlanta, uh, there was a, a section of the city, and you can see it looks pretty tough. It's a pretty poor looking area. It looks pretty, pretty run down. This is called Tanyard Bottoms, uh, sometimes known as Tech Flats. And uh, the city of Atlanta uh, raised this to the ground uh, and it, with the thought that they would replace it with public housing. And this was an integrated neighborhood. And in its place, they created tech homes in Atlanta and they segregated it white. Now, because the um, federal government complained that this was only for white um, Americans. Oh, by the way, here they are sitting in their home. Oh, I have some figures. This is actually really interesting. Hold on a minute. I want to tell you what the rent was in one of these homes. Let's see if I can find it quickly without making you wait too long. Oh, for a three-room apartment in tech, ho tech homes, you would pay $16 a month to rent. <laughs> if you wanted four rooms, $20. <coughs> And six rooms, holy macro, when was the last time you saw an apartment with six rooms, $38. And that included electricity. Wow. Right, exactly. Yeah, too bad we don't see that today, right? So the tech homes were white. And so in response to the government's protest, the federal government's protest that this, they were building uh, only white public housing, uh, the city of Atlanta designed university homes uh, which opened in 1938, and that was segregated black. Here's another example from St. Louis. Uh, the city of St. Louis took um, this integrated, integrated 50-50, right, half and half, half black Americans, half white Americans, in this relatively poor kind of rundown area called DeSoto Car, and they leveled that as well and then set to um, set planning uh, neighborhood gardens, which was a segregated white community. Carr Square Village in 1942 eventually was built, segregated black, and built on the former site of the, of the Car, DeSoto Carr area. Same thing in New York City with the Harlem River houses in 1937 being segregated black and the Williamsburg homes being segregated white. Right, so just to sum, sum up, right, public housing that was originally intended to be for black and white Americans, uh, integrated neighborhoods were, are now being segregated. Okay. So another way that uh, the government segregated black and white populations <coughs> was through something called racial zoning. And this began when, um, in the aftermath of the <coughs> Great Migration. So between 1915 and 1940, uh, upwards of six million uh, African Americans migrated from the Deep South, uh, as you can see, all over the country. Uh, some stayed in, in southern cities, but others moved both north and west. And this uh, influx of black Americans into areas where they had not been anymore did cause some racial tensions, but also caused city uh, governments to create uh, these, these zoning uh, ordinances, right? So these were used 
where there were in cities where there were large large populations of African Americans, and their goal, right, is to contain Black Americans into physically into certain communities. <coughs> so the very first zoning law was in Baltimore in 1910. And this was literally a block by block segregation. So uh, black Americans were not permitted to move into uh, uh, neighborhoods, blocks where that were all white and vice versa. And this came about, this ordinance came about because there was a prominent black attorney who decided to, who bought a house and moved into an all white block. And so Milton Daschle, the, the person, the attorney who drafted the ordinance, you can see his referral to some black Americans who wanted to uh, leave their neighbors behind and, quote, get as close to the company of white people as circumstances will permit. In other words, they were getting a little uppity and wanting to move into the white neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And this ordinance was a way to, to prevent it. A bunch of other cities, northern cities, uh, excuse me, southern and border cities, uh, issue these ordinances as well, um, as you can see here. And uh, according to the New Republic, which was pretty new in 1915, but was also a, a relatively progressive newspaper, uh, argued that this ra racial segregation should continue, quote, until Negroes ceased wanting to amalgamate with whites which I found uh, particularly amusing considering that the country had a long history of amalgamation <laughs> starting from when black slave owner owners raped their black slaves, right? So this amalgamation had been going on for quite some time. Uh, so in uh, St. Louis in 1910, uh, a zoning ordinance was, was passed, uh, the same sort of um, idea as what happened in, uh, in, in Baltimore, right? The zoning to prevent movement into finer residential districts by colored people. Right? Same sort of language. These were pretty effective, as you can see in St. Louis. Uh, notice the statistic at the bottom that between 47 and 52 out of 70,000 housing units in St. Louis, 0.05% of them were available to African Americans. That's pretty dismal. Well, uh, racial zoning laws uh, kind of took a hit in 1917 when the Supreme Court ruled in Buchanan v. Worley that um, these uh, racial zoning, the racial zoning law in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, was unconstitutional. But interestingly, they did not rule, the court did not rule that it was illegal or unconstitutional because uh, it violated the civil protection, civil rights of, of black uh, Americans, but because it interfered with the property, uh, property owner's rights. So um, it, it, the court argued that people who owned property should be able to sell to whomever they wanted. So this was kind of a victory, but not really, because it still allowed uh, uh, cities uh, to, to um, segregate, but to use other methods to do so. Right? So uh, cities, in the wake of, of the uh, Buchanan case, started to move towards city planning. And this was just a more wide-scale way to accomplish racial segregation. Uh, they realized very quickly that if they put in their zoning laws, if they wrote into their zoning laws any mention of race, that they would be struck down because of Buchanan. And so they, um, they used a, a, a different sort of framing in order to, in order to, um, uh, to justify their racial uh, segregation. And actually, they were correct when they, when they thought that they wouldn't be dinged uh, if they left out the word race, because in 1926, in the case of uh, Euclid, Euclid v. Ambler, 
uh, the uh, Supreme Court said that zoning regu uh, regulations could be upheld as long as there was some connection to the public welfare. So this became the new way that city planners could segregate by citing sort of safety and public welfare um, uh, rules or, or concerns. So here's uh, Robert Witten, and he was a, a pretty um, well-known city planner. He, he did a lot of planning in, in, as you can see here, Atlanta, Cleveland, New York. And notice how in this quote from him, he refers to things like neighborhoods had to be protected from any further damage to values resulting from the encroachment of the colored race. Now it does mention race, but it, specific, it, it explicitly frames this in a protective uh, way of, of, of thinking, right? So this was a way to protect neighborhoods. Uh, another aspect to zoning is, is industrial. So at the same time that these city planners are creating these um, uh, racially based segre segregated uh, uh, planning, uh, another uh, purpose was to separate white neighborhoods from industry. And so certain segments of the cities were marked as industrial. Um, they wanted to keep uh, white citizens away from smelly, polluting kind of, of industries, uh, tanneries in particular come to mind. Tanneries are uh, where uh, skins are, are prepared of animals. They, they turn them into leather. It's pretty, they use acids and other, you know, pretty foul uh, stuff. Um, interestingly though, uh, in, in the city planning, um, uh, they labeled land for future industrialization right next to black neighborhoods, right next to African American neighborhoods. And they even made a provision so that zoning could be changed from residential to industrial if black families began to move into them. Uh, there, uh, in my reading, there were some really clever ways that, that some cities went about doing this, like building a, building a, um, a uh, playground in an industrial zone in the hopes that black families would move in, or building a school right in the area to draw black families in. And these industrial zoning laws were, were amazingly effective at, at, at what they did um, per uh, these two studies. So in 1983, the uh, US General Accounting Office noted that, these, that commercial waste treatment facilities and waste dumps uh, were more likely to be found near African Americans, African American communities uh, than white residential areas. And, and another study by the United Churches of, of Christ, they proposed that the percent of minorities living near incinerators was 89% higher than the national median. And that there was only a one in 10,000th chance, that's hard to say, one in 10,000th chance of the racial distribution occurring randomly. So this was purposeful, in other words, was the finding of this study. <coughs> OK, so zoning, zoning ordinan ordinances were really helpful at isolating um, low-income black communities from white communities. Uh, but the government in 1973, uh, specifically um, uh, well, later the Hoover administration, um, decided to uh, encourage white Americans <coughs> to move into a more suburban area, more suburban areas, by buying their own homes. And isn't it fascinating the way that they frame own your own home for your children's sake, right? The US Department of Labor is behind this. And they printed up a whole bunch of these, like millions of these flyers and put them up in, in businesses and, uh, and, and in factories so white Americans would see these, right? And, and then on the, on the right there, sort of the, the uber masculine kind of be a man who owns his own home, right? Be a real American. And part of this, this um, framing, of course, is in the, in the face of what happens in, in, during this period, the Red Scare, where uh, uh, communism was, was a specter that Americans at the time were like super worried about, you know, if, like that ever went away. 
And then in 1922, the Better Homes Movement uh, comes along, uh, and this was during the Hoover administration, as a way to encourage white Americans to build homes, to buy homes, to keep their homes maintained, uh, and look at the little guy who is, who is the wage earner, right? And he's, he's walking across the real estate board which is keeping him from falling into the pit of financial difficulties. I love cartoons like this, it's mm -hmm. so great, right? Um, and when he gets to the other side, ta-da, own your own home. Really interesting too is that the Hoover administration promoted um, uh, this, this, this conference where they invited uh, uh, business leaders, uh, real estate developers, uh, uh, car, you know, car, uh, construction companies, and all kinds of people affiliated with the home uh, building uh, uh, industry to this big conference. Uh, and I, I couldn't help but wonder if this wasn't sort of the precursor of the home show that we have today. I'll have to research that a little bit more. All right, the Better Homes Manual was written, and as you can see, it's encouraging people to not live in apartments anymore because apartments are seen as, quote, the worst kind of housing. Mm -hmm. They're overcrowded because of the ignorant racial habit of African Americans and European immigrants. What does that mean? What do you mean? What does that mean, the ignorant The ignorant habit? habits, the ignorance ha ignorant habit is they're all crowding in together. Into these, into these apartment buildings. Well, there was a problem with home ownership for, for most Americans at the time. Um, first of all, housing was expensive, uh, especially considering there wasn't a lot of it. I told you there was a, a housing shortage, so that makes the price of houses go up. Plus, there's a problem with mortgages. So back uh, during the, um, in, the, in the 20s, if you wanted to take a mortgage out on a home, you had to put 50% down, 50% down. Uh, and, the, and your payments were interest only payments. And then there was a balloon payment, five to seven years later, you had to pay the whole blinking thing off, right? Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yes, and um, uh, so there's no, um, um, you don't build any equity basically in the house. Uh, were, were women allowed to have mortgages? I don't think that they were because women were not allowed to have make contract to sign, you know, have any contracts. Yeah. And as I mentioned before, the Great Depression made this even worse. Um, uh, consider, right, that um, foreclosure rates stood at more than 1,000 a day the beginning of the Great Depression. If you can't work, you can't make money, you can't pay your mortgage. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. Well, what, do, Robin, do you know what would happen like, to the housing that was foreclosed on now? Um, well, for a time, they were just closed up. But then when the homeowner's loan corporation came around, they started buying up these mortgages. So they'd buy up the mortgage and they'd remortgage them for people and made them more able to afford them. So they buy the mortgage and they started giving them 15 year repayment schedules. Later on that gets increased to 25 years. Um, they're am uh, amortized so that you're paying part like you do today if you buy a home, you pay part interest and part on the, on the principal. So you build up equity. This is a way of building up equity into the home. Um, and then when the loan is paid off, the home is yours, right? But the problem was that um, the, how, to, how to know if purchasers, how to know if the people that you were giving these mortgages to could afford to, have, to, to pay these mortgages. And so the HOLC enlists the help of real estate agents around the country, realtors around the country, uh, to help them figure out which, you know, how, who could pay for these loan, who could pay for these mortgages and, and who couldn't. Now keep in mind that in the, the Code of Ethics uh, of the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, there is this clause that says that uh, a realtor should never be instrumental in introducing to a neighborhood members of any race or nationality whose presence will clearly be detrimental to property values in that neighborhood. So they're going into this 
assignment already with a bias, obviously. And so this is probably the zoning that most of you are most familiar with, uh, redlining, redlining for mortgage security. So realtors went into these communities and they labeled them. They created these zoning maps and they labeled them. Uh, each area was labeled either, either green, best, blue, still desirable, yellow, definitely declining, or red, hazardous. Uh, and, uh, and then the neighborhoods that were hazardous, mm -hmm. of course, uh, or even, even definitely declining, were the people who lived in, in those neighborhoods were unlikely to get mortgage help from the HOLC. And there's a really explicit <coughs> racial um, uh, angle to these to this uh, zoning. So if you if you notice here under green best, uh, one of the comments is not a single foreigner or Negro. That was why one of the reasons why it was declared best. Um, a red district has little or no value due to the colored element, or the adverse racial influence, which are noticeably increasing. So it's, it's very explicitly race, uh, a bias, very explicitly uh, racial. And I want to take a minute out of this um, PowerPoint and show you this wonderful, wonderful website. I don't know if any of you who are educators in this room have ever seen this. This is called Mapping Inequality, and this was a collaborative between several, um, several universities. There were like four different teams from three different universities, or the other way around, and uh, they uh, have digitized all these um, zoning maps all around the country. So this helps us to see a little bit what the HOLC had in mind, right? So these are hot spots where good mortgage lenders with available funds are willing to make their maximum loans. Still desirable, still good, but not as hot as A areas. And then the declining ones, mm, mortgage lenders are more conservative here. And then, of course, hazardous. They recommend lenders refuse to make loans in these areas or only on a conservative basis. And so this is a map of Providence, Rhode Island. They didn't have fall, they didn't do Fall River or New Bedford, I would have included those. But but yeah, take a look at what is labeled what, right? Isn't this, I think this might be Fox Point. No, Fox Point is 26. No? Maybe 26. 26. Ah. Okay, down here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a little hard to tell because this is before they, they moved the, re they relocated the Providence River and all, but it's really fascinating. Most of Providence is in the D category, yeah. uh, C category, excuse me. Yeah. But Fox Point was Portuguese at this point. 26 was Portuguese and it's in the right, right here. Yeah. Right, yeah. they were immigrants, they were Portuguese mm -hmm. immigrants. Yeah, so it's you can, you can actually. Which kind of surprising. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there could be uh, water, you know, supported dumps yeah. in the yeah. area. Yeah. Really, really fascinating. I was, I taught uh, in the Bronx a while back, and um, the, I was a member of the American Federation of Teachers. My students went into a bank that redlined the neighborhood that I lived in. There you go. So, yeah. There you go. Super. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you. <laughs> I'm going to come back to those maps in a few minutes. Um, I want to show you. Um, uh, 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 we're going to look at uh, a section of Harlem. Um, so, um, all right. So, uh, the, in addition to this, uh, to uh, the HOLC, the National Housing Act, of course, 1934, uh, ensured these mortgages. Right, ensured these mortgages up to 80 percent of the purchase price. But again, if you look at this little section from the manual here, you'll see that incompatible racial groups should not be permitted to live in the same communities. If a neighborhood is to retain stability, it is necessary that the property shall continue to be occupied by the same social classes <coughs> and racial classes. 
And this um, it impacts a decision or impacts a community in Detroit in this way. So a builder uh, is, was trying to build a, devel a development in Detroit, but because this, uh, this piece of property that he, was per that he purchased was very close to a black neighborhood, uh, he couldn't get the loans that he needed from the FHA. The FHA refused to give him the loans to start building this, this community. So he literally constructed a cement wall, half mile, uh, a half mile long, six feet high, and one foot thick between the black neighborhood and the, his property. And sure enough, the FHA then approved the loans for this neighborhood. And actually, the wall still stands today. And it's been turned into this incredible work of art. People in, in Detroit, uh, at least on, the, um, on one side of it, um, have created these wonderful murals all along the, all along the wall. Pretty dramatic. Of course, uh, in World War II, um, post-World War II, the idea of the segregated suburb really took hold, uh, where um, uh, people like William Levitt, who created Levitt Towns, uh, applies for um, both FHA and, and um, VHA, FHA help uh, in order to get uh, loans from local banks to build their um, their communities and uh, of course they weren't approved. These plans were not approved, the loans were not approved if African Americans lived nearby and threatened integration into these neighborhoods. Before we go into restrictive car covenants, I want to go back for one minute because I told you we would look at, we would look at, um, <coughs> at, at uh, Manhattan for a minute. So this is the same community, uh, this, excuse me, this is the same website we were looking at a minute ago. This is Manhattan, and this area here is what's called Sugar Hill in Harlem. And if I click on it, we can look at the details. And this is just to emphasize the fact that these decisions were very much racial. So if we go down, uh, the list here, we can see that the according to this information, it's 90% quote Negro. Look at the estimated annual family income. What year is this again? This is in 1930, 19, late 1930s, early 1940s. Interesting to see the difference now. You know. Oh yeah, but, but look at the estimated family income. Ten million dollars in Sugar Hill. Do you know why, Chris? Being, you know, ten million. This was the se this was sort of the epicenter of the Harlem Renaissance. So people that were living in this community were people like Ella Fitzgerald and and uh, and um, Cab Calloway and Duke Ellington. Uh, Thurgood Marshall lived here at one point, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, there were a lot of very wealthy black Americans who lived in this community, and yet it was redlined. Now if we go down, let's go down and see if we can find a green neighborhood, because green is the best neighborhood we know. Let's click here. The rock <laughs> oh, don't mess up on me. Come back, come back. Come back. A7, that little green square. Notice that there are no Negroes living there. Look at the family income. Wow. Oh, wow. Ten thousand to a hundred thousand, and that's green. They get the mortgages. They get the insurance. Fascinating, right? 
you don't need any other argument, to, any other evidence to support the fact that this was so racially motivated than that. All right, let's talk about restrictive covenants. So co restrictive covenants were, um, we, you might think of them as today's like um, neighborhood, you know how some neighborhoods you move into, there's a neighborhood agreement, you can't paint your house a certain color, you can't do this, you can't do that. Well, restrictive covenants uh, early on, like this one in 1925, set about to make agreements amongst residents in a particular neighborhood not to sell their homes to certain people. And you can see here that it says that um, no person other than one of the white or Caucasian race shall be permitted to occupy any property in said addition or portion thereof building or building thereon except a domestic servant actually employed by a person of white or Caucasian race. So you couldn't buy a home in this neighborhood if you were a black family, but if you lived in the house with a white family and worked as their maid or nanny, you were all set. Mm. Well, that's awfully small. I apologize for that. <laughs> So this, this, these covenants were confirmed by, a, by the Supreme Court in 1926 that uh, reasoned that these private individuals could make these particular agreements and, uh, with one another because, once again, this was the protection of property rights that we saw earlier in the Buckley case. And then in 1948, confirmed again in the Shelley case where these, um, the, the covenants were deemed not uh, to violate the 14th Amendment, but if states enforced them, that was the line that the court wouldn't, wouldn't cross. So as long as um, the state didn't try to enforce these covenants, it was okay to have them. Amazing, right? Sometimes um, when people tried to uh, push back against these covenants, uh, it, ended up with, uh, it ended up in violence. So this is uh, the, the Wade family, Charlotte, Rosemary, and Andrew. And they uh, were living in, in uh, Louisville, and they wanted to buy their own home. They couldn't find one that they, that they really liked. And so they kept going to this neighborhood with a realtor, this all-white neighborhood, and no one would sell them a home because they were a black family. Well, eventually, they had a, they had a, friends of, uh, a couple who were friends of theirs buy a home and then transfer the deed to them. Well, the day after they moved into their home, someone burned a cross in the lot next to their home. Uh, after that, uh, you can see right here, their windows are smashed. People threw rocks through their windows, including uh, some with uh, notes wrapped around them saying, and go home. Um, someone shot a rifle through their front door. <coughs> And eventually, their house was dynamited. Oh my gosh! Dynamited. The uh, cross burner and the and the bomber uh, confessed, but they were not charged. Um, however, the white family that sold that transferred the the house to them was brought up on charges. They were indicted by a grand jury for um, inciting racial violence. And in 1973, uh, the Commission on Civil Rights uh, gave a nod to the fact that these types of, that the, both the housing industry and the government came together to create this, this situation, right, this segregated housing. All right. So um, there's this implicit fear of white homeowners that when black Americans moved into homes in, their, in these white neighborhoods, that their property values would drop. And all evidence to the contrary, because when black homeowners would buy into um, sort of borderline neighborhoods, they ended up having to pay more for their homes because they couldn't get these special mortgages and insurance. And so consequently, the home values went up. But unscrupulous uh, uh, 
uh, real estate agents took advantage of white uh, fear and uh, they would do, they, they would create a, this system called blockbusting. So what they would do is they might buy a house in a white neighborhood and rent it to a black family. Uh, they might pay uh, a black woman to walk through the neighborhood with a baby carriage. They would um, pay a black uh, young black men to drive through these neighborhoods with their windows open in their car and their music on really loud. They take a black man with them and go ringing doorbells asking people if their homes were for sale. And this created so much fear within these white neighborhoods that their property values were going to drop that they started to sell their homes to these land speculators at a much reduced rate. So they would sell them to the land speculators for cheap because they wanted to get the heck out of there. They would panic. Um, and then the speculators would turn around and sell them to black families at inflated prices. And then they'd move on to the next community over, the next community over, the next community over. <laughs> Uh, often when the speculators would sell homes to these black families, they would do so on a, con on a contract basis. So the, the white land speculators could get mortgages and federal um, insurance on their, uh, on, their, on their, these homes. So they would purchase them and then they would make a contract with black uh, families uh, to live in the home and pay off their home on an installment plan. Now the thing about the installment plan was you never built up any equity in your home, number one, and number two, they were so stringent that if you were late for at least one payment, just late on one payment, you could potentially lose, you could potentially be evicted. And because you had no equity built up in this home, you were out on the streets with nothing. And I know this is a long quote, but uh, this uh, quote I found particularly fascinating because it speaks to how hard black families worked to keep these contract homes. They'd work two jobs, they'd work double shifts. They would subdivide their homes so that they could rent out portions of the homes. And these made the communities uh, more crowded the schools became more crowded. When the schools became crowded, some schools went on double, double shifts, and this left kids um, going to school half the day and having half the day to themselves. To their, it left them to their own devices. Uh, gangs, when gangs moved in, they played on these kids who didn't really have a lot to do with their time after school, and the gangs then would, would um, go after uh, business owners and shopkeepers and white people just fled these neighborhoods in droves. But if you were black families who purchased your house through contract, you had no choice but to stay. You could not sell that home. You were stuck there. All right, I'm going to skip over this because we're getting a little short on time. Let's talk, about, let's talk about the legacy of racial segregation or residential segregation. So I have several charts from the um, uh, Center for, I forgot the name of it, I'm sorry, CAP. I'm blanking. It's okay, we don't need to know. All right, so here's a chart showing um, how uh, uh, the uh, comparison between uh, black and Hispanic and white homeowners from 1940 to 2017. Does that, does that say that 1970 is where Hispanics started to? Well, I, there's a division right there. Actually, it's a little bit earlier. It starts like right here. Yeah. yeah a little bit before 1970, around 1970, where there's a little bit of just, you know, they separate a little bit. Center for American Progress. Yes, I remembered it. Here's salaries. Uh, 
again, we started out with a with a, um, a a clip from the Hate You Give movie, and and uh, where Marv is saying, you know, they're just there aren't any jobs in our neighborhood. Uh, black Amer black men are are laid off more often. Uh, and they are out of work longer. It takes them longer to find uh, employment than, than white men, as a rule. Robin, is there a problem with that last one? Uh, why do people say 98? Between the ages 25 to 54? Oh, I don't know. Good question. I didn't notice that. Good eye, Nancy. <laughs> I got my driver's license. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. I passed the test. <laughs> All right. Um, wealth, right? Wealth is being the difference between uh, what you have and what you owe. You know, things that you the, that you own and, and versus your debt. Uh, and you can see that the 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 um, uh, racial wealth gap has 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 exponentially risen, and that's only since 1990. And don't forget that the number one way that Americans uh, hold their wealth is property. property in homes, right, absolutely. If we adjust for college education, the top is net wealth, the top, the bottom is, is adjusting for college education. So even education, college education is not a fix for this problem. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. This is at the micro level. So here's two St. Louis communities. And you can see that this um, disparity, uh, that, that disparity in wealth um, impacts uh, other things too, like health, like longevity. Persistent school segregation goes along with this as well. This is uh, incredible to think that non-white school districts get $23 billion less than white districts. $23 billion less. Is that what they mean by separate but equal? Separate but equal. That was supposed to have gone away, wasn't it? Right? Yes. Well, and this is, I mean, in The Hate You Give, yeah. Star talks about how her parents sent her mm -hmm. to the rich yep. white prep school because you only go to the local high school to get... To get I think she says get jumped, to get high, and, and yeah. get pregnant, yeah. right, exactly. Yep, so absolutely. So they're sending them to another school so they can actually mm -hmm. get a good education right. because yep. the public school is supposed is to be the great equalizer, yeah. but the persistent right. inequity like mm -hmm. this is not right. And Kathleen, you mentioned um, separate but equal, which of course um, all of you I'm sure have heard of, of the Brown v. Board of Education Topeka, Kansas case, which was supposed to end uh, segregation in schools. But uh, the Milliken decision went way in the other direction. Right? So Milliken, uh, in the Milliken case, the court decided that um, Desegregation in the sense of dismantling a dual school system did not require any particular racial balance in each school, grade, or classroom. So the Milliken decision has gone a long, long way to creating those numbers that we just saw a second ago. So I just want to show you one other thing. It's this really great website, another website. So this is a call. Uh, this is a base. This website was created based on research by this Ed Build Build Group, uh, and this particular part of the website shows um, how uh, neighborhoods, side by side neighborhoods, have um, uh, incredibly uh, ridiculous uh, separation in how schools are funded. 
So let's see if I can actually get this to work. If I can get this to work, we will try to zoom in on one of these things. Oh, let's see. Let me go down. Click on the state. Okay, I tried to. Okay, there's Kentucky. Let's not look at Kentucky. <coughs> oh, no, come on. There you are. Okay. I wanted to go to Massachusetts if we can get it. Let's try to make it smaller. Maybe we can get over to Massachusetts. Cooperate, please. There we are. I think you have to scroll down and then you Do you have to? State. Think so, Rebecca? I, I, yes. Oh, and then so put in the... Um, Click on a state. Oh, you're the best. Thank you. All right. So here we are in Massachusetts. So let's click on, uh, oh, I don't know. Here. So there's the Worcester School District next to the Millbury School District. I don't know how well you can see that. So the student poverty rate in the Worcester School District is 22%, 7% in Millbury. And uh, the revenue per, per pupil uh, looks not so great, but look at how many students. Yeah. And then the percentage of the non-white. Yep. So let's look at a different one. This is Brockton and Abington. This is, this is, I, I was thinking of you, Kathleen, with some of these um, websites because you're so interested in this mapping kind of thing. Um, but it's, it's, this is such an incredible resource for anybody that's, that's doing any teaching to show this type of inequality. All right. Um, do they have Fall River? I don't, is that what you said, Ron? Do they have Fall River? I don't think so, but let's look. Let me zoom out. I know you could spend all day, right? Yeah. I'm not doing a very good job of navigating this. I'm sorry. Well, anyway, I don't want to hold you all up any longer. I just want to, before we, I hand this back over to Chris, I was wondering if you had any questions. I'll, I, can get, I can send you the website if you're interested and we can. Yes, thank you. I'll, I can send you my list of sources. I heard a, a report today on the content of history <laughs> books that are used in public schools. And the public schools in Maine have history books that don't mention slavery and they oh don't mention gosh. civil rights. Oh my I mean, you'd think yeah. that that would, if you said Texas, I would have been, yeah. oh yeah, yeah no, yeah, 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 I can yeah, see yeah. that, right? Oh, but but Maine? Maine? Uh, it's a white Yikes. Oh, very white. Yes. It's very white. Well, how are they even yes. transferring them from high schools into the college system? Yeah. They come in unprepared. Well, yeah, yeah. that's what I'm saying, right? Or a lot of my students are really very unaware of racial his, you know, mm -hmm. the history of race in this country. Yeah. They really don't know a lot about well, slavery. The they don't know, that. you know. Did you teach a class on that problem? What? African American yeah. history? Yeah. So. No? Questions? Comments? Where are we going? You know? yeah. Good question. Yeah, such a missed opportunity. I don't have the I don't have that answer. I wish I did. Um, some of the some of the readings I did um, in in suggesting how this problem can be solved is um, it, it they researchers say that it's it's going to take government intervention and some very purposeful, purposeful um, work. Um, even th th some of those school districts are even, have even been gerrymandered. Mm -hmm. That's a whole other problem. Mm -hmm. sure gerrymandered. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, well, I mean, I think, think too, I mean, stuff like this, awareness, right? Because like, I think, especially if you're a white American, it can be easy, like I was talking about at the beginning, to be like, Oh, slavery's been, you know, slavery ended 200 years ago. What's the problem, right? But 
when you're not aware of the continued suppression of black people. Um, the, as I put it, the, it's a legacy. It's yeah, a legacy. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, the disparity that exists is because all that wealth accumulation was denied, right? It's, wealth accumulation is generational. Mm -hmm. and, exactly, uh, exactly. And all these opportunities were denied, so mm -hmm. there is there's there is no wealth in, in certain parts of the world. Right. I heard this idea like about six months ago, and I was like wondering your opinion on it. Part of a way to help solve this is to lower the average price of homes, and a way to do that is to sort of pull back on zoning restrictions for when building homes. Hmm. So you don't need to be as like not as specific, but like, if you have a zoning district where. Uh, it's so tough to explain. Like, there's a, I live in Somerset, a new housing area just got popped up. And it's all two floor homes. Like, it's a pretty rich neighborhood. But part of the reason they did that was because the zoning laws on it were so restricted that they could only build that type of home in mm -hmm. that type of area. And, ah. and so it jacked up the prices of those homes like $350,000. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So a, a lot of, a lot of low income and a lot of, African American communities, if they are in that low income bracket, they can't afford that. Mm -hmm. Right. So right. Gentrification. Gentrification. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And and, and I didn't I didn't talk about I ran out of time. I didn't talk about urban yeah. renewal and the destruction and raising you know flattening of African American neighborhoods uh, in order to make way for industry, uh, in order to make way for the interstate interstate highways took you know destroyed many low income black neighborhoods. Um, in, in urban areas. Uh, another solution that I heard, uh, actually I think it was on that Ed Build site, um, uh, is to change the way that we um, uh, give money to schools. So instead of it being so locally based, right, so the state gives so much and then local communities, you know, give what they can and those are based on property values. And so uh, one solution someone suggested was to uh, make all, um, uh, make all, uh, 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 make it state at the state level, funding for schools at the state level. So that you put all into a big pot and then, you know, of course people in wealthy areas will have to swallow very hard and probably complain very loudly. Who are the politicians to begin with? Right. The school vouchers are gonna kill our public schools. Again, that's another topic. Yeah. I think too, this brings up, you know, I mean, this is where like, I mean, this is related to the whole discussion of like reparations. I mean, I mean the whole idea behind that is that you know, wealth has been denied and stolen from in some cases from African Americans. Mm -hmm. So it, right. reparations would be a way to try, in some small way, but not by any means, make up for it, but right. to. Of course, that's a, whole, that. that's a whole That's a hot but issue. But, but, issue too. but that's the but that's the logic behind it. Is right. that you would have to do reparations without doing reparations. You would have to do. <laughs> no, yeah. seriously. You'd have to do it without it. calling it reparations. Yeah, you would have to yes. do a multi multiple yeah. different mm -hmm. policies that are targeted at that without calling it reparations. Right. Right. So that it can have to get through. Yeah. 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 I think if this teaches us anything, at the very least, it teaches us that we have to have government oversight. All the abuses of these banks taking advantage, although the government was certainly- They were, govern they were government they agencies were, that, yes. were, that were know, part of it. I know, but the bank, like what I'm saying is, if we want to go forward, I think that we need to make sure that, you know, these corporations aren't just allowed to do whatever the heck they want. Well, and just to make it like sort of this circular loop kind of thing, um, think about who was in power when all of these laws were made, right? There were white politicians. These were white men, pretty much, who were in charge. Um, and that also speaks to the idea of like power, right? Who has power in, in our society? And it's the people who have money. <laughs> All right, Christy wanted to well, say something yeah, well, about Yeah, I think we should get Robin to
yeah, thank you for this very informative session. And it uh, looks like we'll have it on video later, which is great. So we can share it with other people as well. Uh, some of you have students you'd like to share it with. Um, so I just um, wanted to end by saying, um, so we've got a few more um, one book related things happening this semester. Uh, one, uh, especially for you students, um, there's a there's an essay writing contest that you'll start to see flyers um, kind of going up around school about uh, that we're doing in coordination with the Writing Center. Um, so if you're in any classes where you are engaging with the hate you give and you're doing a writing assignment related to it, submit that to the contest and you could win uh, a nice little financial prize. Um, so that's going to be happening in coordination with the Writing Center. Um, or, I mean, even if you're not doing it in a class, if you just want to write an essay related to the hate you give and submit it, then you can do that. And then we're also uh, co-sponsoring uh, an event with the uh, Bristol Sins Against Hate Colloquium. It's going to be happening at the end of March. It's going to be a, kind of a spoken word poetry event. Oh, yeah. um, so there actually were auditions happening for that today. I think there's still a chance to like, maybe get in an audition. Um, but even if you're not auditioning, you can certainly come. So that's going to be in the, the art gallery on, I don't yes. want to say, March 30th. It's going to be the end of March. Um, Such a beautiful venue. Yeah, yeah, it's a beautiful venue. And it's going to be just about how, how do we inspire and create unity. So it's going to be some spoken word and things like that.